As retail looks forward to returning to normal, most of the attention is focused on which brands will be opening stores and what the new omni-channels might look like. However, we might be overlooking what else needs to change. Will post-pandemic retail simply be a rollout of the way we always did things? Or will brands reimagine new ways to connect with consumers so they can drive both sales and profits? I'm Jane Singer, and welcome to A Seat at the Table. I put that question to Andrew Smith, a transformational retail leader who focuses on the future of retail and customer experience, and is co-founder and managing partner of Think Uncommon, a retail innovation think tank. Andrew has worked with both established retailers and startups to develop action-focused strategies to help them thrive in highly competitive markets. In this episode, he'll share some of what he sees as opportunities for brands and retailers to rethink as they reopen. Before we get started, if you're looking for precise trend information that will define your next best sellers, then Spin Expo is the place to go. It's the primary exhibition for yarns and knitwear. Spin Expo provides a well-edited selection of top quality products that are filled with creativity, as well as trend information that cannot be found anywhere else. To learn more, go to spinexpo.com. That's S-P-I-N-E-X-P-O dot com. You can also find a link in the show notes for this episode. Now let's sit down with Andrew and learn how we can seize the opportunity to rebuild retail. Right now, we're finally starting to see retail reopening. So I'm really happy to have you join me on a seat at the table today, Andrew. You're more than welcome. I'm excited to be here. Uh, any chance to talk retail? Oh, great. <laughs> well, I think that now, as this vaccine rolling is rolling out, and uh, we're finally starting to feel that we can be optimistic, right, about retail actually opening and staying open, I think that it's a good time for people to start to to rethink retail. I mean, people, many people are referring to the pandemic as the great reset. Uh, so when you're looking at retail, what do you think we need to reset and why? I mean, it's a, it's a fabulous way to think about it. Any disruption, certainly one of this scale, is going to you know shift the dynamics of an industry, right? And, you know, we've seen COVID do that. We've seen COVID, obviously, you've, you know, there's a thousand people saying, you know, pulling different numbers, but essentially we've seen innovation accelerate at a dramatic rate. We've seen consumer behaviors shift, in a, you know, faster than they normally would have um, without this disruption. And you've seen a lot of brands that didn't have the, you know, the deeper pockets and the bank, um, the, uh, the bank sheets to be able to survive it. And, you know, that's going to leave this kind of space that is going to be filled when the world does eventually kind of return to whatever the next normal looks like. Um, we, the way that I think of it, though, is slightly different to most. You know, COVID is obviously a huge uh, disruption, but it isn't the existential crisis that I think retail should look at. Um, economic recovery isn't, new brands emerging isn't. Disruption has happened since the Istanbul bazaars to retail. <laughs> right, and, and from, right. From within retail and from without to like outside of it as well. You know, consumer expectations are being reset across industries. And we often are too focused on, you know, how are my fellow retailers disrupting the customer experience when we should be looking at how is Google and how is the restaurant industry and how the hotel industry and the travel industry resetting the expectations of what consumers are looking at as well, uh, looking for as well. So, you know, we, we need to look beyond that. So we, we see that the reset needs to be reframed slightly which is that the biggest uh, single biggest existential crisis facing retail is um, the ability to change and change fast and broadly as possible um, and you know if you can have that ingrained ability to adapt to a disruption then you can survive any existential crisis that gets thrown at you and, and you look at some of the big brands that have been able to pivot and adapt super quickly in 2020 um, you know, those are the ones who had focused on that how of innovation. Um, so you know, re retail innovation is one of those things that's really interesting because we, we have this persistent negative narrative over the industry, obviously, that says, you know, retail's dying, it's being taken over by online, all that kind of stuff, which is, in my view, utter rubbish. You know, retail isn't dying, it's growing, online isn't killing it, it's growing it. And the brands that can adapt to this, this you know, shifted environmental and, you know, retail ecosystem are the ones that are going to do well. And the ones that 
you know, the big brands, the Starbucks, the Nike, the Targets, the Walmarts, all spent years building up this this internal ability um, to change, to innovate, to you know, adapt. Whether it was bought in, um, whether it was slowly evolved over time, you know, acquired, whatever. Um, they've been focused on the how part of innovation, and that's what sets them apart and sets apart their reactions, I think, into you know disruptions like COVID. So you had just said that you felt that online, right, the big e-commerce players were not actually killing retail. Um, they were actually growing it. Um, explain to me how you see that happening. I think, you know, we when the malls, you know, started to kind of, the idea of a mall started to grow in, uh, you know, post-World War II and then, of course, into the 50s and 60s when they started becoming a bit more mainstream, everyone had this same conversation of malls are going to kill the high streets. And what we eventually saw over time, of course, is the high streets evolved. The main strips, the bustling kind of local strips just evolved to be different, different um, roles, to have a different role. And you know, online retail is doing the exact same thing now. You're not an online retailer or a brick and mortar retailer anymore. You're just a retailer. You've just chosen a different channel. No different to a mall retailer choosing to go to the mall instead of the side street. So you know, we... Um, and, you know, once you choose and make that decision and you become that online retailer um, and there's, you know, DTC style retail brands popping up left, right and center, you can set up a brand in minutes, really. At one point, you're going to hit a, a growth block, a growth ceiling that you have to um, solve for if you want to keep growing. And, the you know, we can see from the numbers that the way to solve for that growth gap, that you can, the growth ceiling that you hit online is to open up physical retail and open up your brand to new customer segments who shop and behave in malls or in the local centers or nearby their local restaurant scene or at work. Um, you know, that's the way brands grow. So that's just gonna be pushing the stores, the physical brick and mortar style of retail to just a different purpose. The role and purpose of stores you know, will shift dramatically. It has already, to be fair. It's just who's keeping up, um, and you know, therefore, you know, we have to change the way we think about the operation of those stores as well. But really, I think on, you'll see all bird stories, Warby Parker stories, Casper stories be a much more regular occurrence. You've got brands like Showfields and Camp who are kind of um, redefining the way physical retail retail can look, um, and I think that will have an influence over the industry. It's just pushing a slightly shift in the role and purpose of stores. And those brands that don't adapt will end up creating a vacancy that will be filled by someone who does. Right, right. So retail is a multifaceted business. Um, where do you see the greatest need for change? I mean, when you look at our current retail industry, are there specific parts, for example, in store experience or the kind of products that are in stores or the marketing or the operations? Where do you, What would you identify as key areas that really need to be rethought? I mean, does anything stand out as like, like this is the area that most retailers are missing the boat on? Uh, there, are, there, are, there are a few, um, sadly. I think... There, there are one, there's one that's much less exciting than any other, so I'll start with that one and I'll finish on the exciting ones. Okay. Um, the way we the way we operate and measure performance is old. It's mm. been you know we've been doing it the same way for you know decades, and we've watched the world change around us. We've watched the way consumers interact with our brands change around us. We've seen this kind of uptick in all of these digital different this digital ecosystem grow of things like buy online, pick up in store, et cetera, et cetera. Yet we still performance manage our you know, frontline teams and our stores and our field teams the same way. And it's quite frankly, it's kind of stupid because it's not measuring what proper growth for a brand right now looks like. So we need to think differently about how, um, you know, how if we've got this changed shifted role of store, we've got this blended ecosystem of retail, which is, consists of online, offline elements. Now, what does success look like for a store now? It no longer is comp sales year on year. Mm. It's would... acquisition of customers. It's market growth in their, you know, digital market growth in your surrounding area. We know from plenty of brands that, that do track it, that if you put a store into a location, your online sales go up. Um, Interesting. And, you know, there is... So if, if we know that, then why isn't that part of the, the measurement system and the way we operationalize our store teams and our, our local teams? Um, so that's the kind of more boring-ish one. But the, um, the other one really is the, uh, the importance of consumers have just had so much thrown at them that 
there is this kind of desire and this trend that we see around people wanting to feel good about who they're giving their money to. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a social enterprise or a charity. It means that I want to feel like you are like-minded. The personality and the brand storytelling elements are increasingly important and in influencing the consumer buying uh, behavior. So you have to, as a brand, whether you're a product in a retailer or whether you're the retailer curating product, you have to think about what is that story and that, that lifestyle story, that brand story that is actually going to be engaging the right people to be coming into your stores who want to feel good about throwing money at you. Um, you know, we the old adage of retail of price, you know, product proximity is still there to an extent. Internet solved for proximity. So right, you've kind of right. got to add in this social value element now of why do people choose Target over Walmart? Why do people choose Five Below over Dollar General if they've got the choice? Mm. Um, there are There's brand storytelling. It's a brand you can feel, you know, engaged with. It has a personality. Um, and I think that that is becoming increasingly important. And, you know, it's not, again, it's not the native tongue of retail. Um, we are really good at curating brands creating end cap stories you know the 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 age old kind of retail operation we are brilliant at but that's kind of like if we keep going with that it's like playing wimbledon with a wooden racket no matter how good we are at tennis mm. someone's going to come along with a new fancy fiberglass racket and probably whip our butts so how do we update the way we think about um, retail as an art form to include a bit more of this kind of brand storytelling element and this experiential stuff Make the stores engaging, shareable, delightful. Um, those kind of experiences are increasingly important. So in other words, if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, then actually brands or retailers, in a sense, need to narrow their focus so that they can better define who they are and then create a story around that, as opposed to trying to be everything to everybody um, in order to catch any and every possible sale. It's, yeah, very much. I mean, it's going to depend on the vertical, obviously, but, the, you know, the old, the adage of stack, it, stack them high, watch them fly, right. of, you know, have as much product as possible you know, is not engaging to consumers anymore because they can, if they want to do that, they'll browse Amazon right. or they'll pop into a Walmart. Um, if you want to create engaging experiences, you tell, a, you tell a beautiful story. You walk into an Allbird store and you see the story of sustainability where the products come from, why the brand was created, who the crazy Kiwis are behind it. You know, it's it's a it's just an artful storytelling. You go into um, a show fields and you'll see curated art from local artists that tell a story of the community. And that's engaging. And there's you go into camp and you can sit at milk bar whilst your kids play with toys and have yourself a boozy milkshake. Like there's all of these kind of experience elements that are making brands engaging that pull people away from the naturally enthralling um, desire for efficiency. Right. Um, and, you know, humans are, we're, a, you know, a pack animal. We've, we love to hang out. Um, but we also have programmed ourselves to be programmed for efficiency. And part of that means that, you know, that's why we love Amazon, because I can click quickly, find my thing, press go, and it's here today or tomorrow. That feels efficient to me. Um, we need to disenthrall consumers. Brands and retailers need to disenthrall consumers and, try and draw them in away from that um, kind of efficient mindset and into one that you know, tickles our fancy a little bit more, makes us excited, energizes us. As I said before, make it shareable, um, right. all of those things. Yeah, so a store needs to be more of a destination and more, like you said, of an experience of something where you take away from it more than just a purchase. Very much so. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to word it. Yeah, I think that, you know, we've gone through sort of decades, right, where it was shopping really was simply about acquiring and acquiring more and acquiring it cheaper. So I think that we've sort of maxed that out, right? And now what you're saying is that we need to go in a very different direction and be able to get more, really, really get deep on that marketing and uh, connection to consumer. Yeah, very much so. And if you think, you know, for that simplicity, that proximity element and efficient element, the internet solved for it. If I have a, a little thing that I want to get that I'm not emotionally attached to, let's say a hammer, you know, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna do that online. Um, if, but if you have, if you have a, a you know, a real estate, um, of store, you know, a store network across the country that 
can truly engage um, consumers in a way that digital cannot, mm. and you get experiences in the stores that engage that digital cannot, then you'll get traffic. You'll absolutely be bringing traffic in. And you can see that in different ways that um, brands are responding. You've got Target obviously announcing um, a bunch of in-store experiences, which I think will be interesting to see how that works for them. Um, and you know, to, to drive traffic flow, Cole partnering with Amazon to try and get customers in for you know returns and, and lockers. Right. Um, there's a lot of people trying different things, but there's you know fewer um, big brands willing to take a leap and try and create something truly engaging. Um, you know, Macy's tried it with Story, mm. and I think they probably took the, the 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 beauty of what Story was and and. Um, kind of took it over a little too much and it, it didn't kind of translate into the Macy's environment. And I think you know, they probably learned an awful lot of lessons from that. But um, yeah, I think, I think you know, there are uh, plenty of brands out there with deep enough pockets to try some really incredible things. And I think if they do it um, and you know, create that really engaging experience that can disenthrall people from you know, the efficient mindset, then they'll do very well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think you know, the issue of deep pockets is really something that comes to mind because you look at what people do and oftentimes it's done, but it's not really done in the depth and breadth to make it really engaging. I mean, I think what Nike is doing, of course, is world class, but you look at other things and, and, and they're a bit superficial. It, it sort of looks like they're moving in that direction, but they haven't really committed to it. Do you know what I mean? Very much so. And I think, um, you know, we again, re- innovation's not the first language of retail. Execution is. So mm. therefore, we get we Good get point. very quickly kind of caught up in the hype of what it is that we're doing and kind of focus too much on just getting it out and kind of saying, t- you know, we've ticked the box and we've got it done. Um, the, the art of innovation comes from testing. It comes from data analyses. It comes from um, a thousand experiments. To, you know, before you find the actual thing that works and has that really powerful impact. And retailers aren't, you know, naturally equipped to have that mindset. So, you know, that's why you don't see as many things kind of go as far as you think they probably could have. Um, if you were a brand like Nike who do it, you know, they, they experiment, they hypothesize, they collect data, they test and test and test. And then, they refine it down to its, you know, to essentially to perfection, and then roll it out, and are probably the, you know, very quietly, one of the best retailers on the planet, even though they don't make a song and dance about it. Right. So yeah, I think retailers just need to have a, you know, the one. Th- this is what we obviously do for a living, but you know, the one thing that we think, you know, when we first recommend is you need to kind of just disenthrall yourself from the way we've always done things, mm. and think about being a little more patient with what the early phases of your innovation pipeline look like because that will mean that you'll get much greater change and much broader change at the out end if you're willing to experiment and try things and put them out in the real world and see what customers think all of this stuff that feels it makes us really nervous and introduces risk sounds expensive all of that stuff none of that's actually true so you know reframe your thinking of the power of you know innovation as a process and look at how it can help you create incredible experiences at the back end, which is going to be tested and proven. Um, Innovation really, when it's done best, is measured and driven. It's not big, huge, blue sky creative. It's just a measured, driven process of execution that enables you to find the best things to do and then do them brilliantly. So in other words, you're looking at it more as incremental change rather than sweeping change. The best retailer innovators on the planet always do incremental change. Very few have big sweeping change. And if, even if they're a new brand that comes in and they feel like they've done that, there's been 10 years of build up. Right. <laughs> so it's like we, you know, we don't see the mess when we're not in the mess. Right. So right. we can kind of stand back and observe a retailer doing these incredible things and think, wow, these guys can just pivot on a dime. Mm. No, they put work in. And they've, you know, they've changed their entire operation internally, transformed their operation internally to be about change, to be about driving consistent and regular change. And, you know, they do it in a measured and driven way. Uh, you know, we, when we were writing the book, we had the privilege of interviewing you know, dozens of retail leaders from brands that were both innovative and not so innovative, some that aren't around anymore, some that are flying. Mm. 
And the one thing that we consistently found was that when a retailer can reframe innovation to be something that they embed into their business, the how rather mm. than the big shiny what, then they do well. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting point. And I think that, you know, nowadays it's so easy to get distracted, right, by all the bright, shiny objects and all, all the uh, various uh, technologies that come in. And oftentimes, like you said, people get caught up in some of those things and, and they forget fundamentally, right, that it's about brand and about identity and about connecting with the customer. Correct. Well, that's the thing. We've, we put the tech hype in the driver's seat instead of the customer. And therefore, we, you know, we walk down the expo aisles of NRF's big show and go, oh, I'll have one of those and one of those. And I'll have one of those because they all look great. And that's what everyone seems to be doing. So I'd love to do that. Let's do that, guys. So, well, you've not put your customer into this conversation whatsoever. And you don't necessarily know whether this is going to add business value. So why do you run at them? And all too often, it feels like the safe thing to do is to just follow, um, follow the, the herd, right? Correct. Sheep mindset. Mm. Follow the herd and just do what everyone else is doing. Now, you haven't tested whether that's going to add value to your customer, add value to your business, or it's even aligned to your business purpose. And if you don't tick those three boxes within innovation, you should never do it. Yet we don't even do the test right? Um, up front. So it's like we just we just run at things because we feel like that's the safe place. It's not. The safe place is doing it properly. And <laughs> the safe place is focusing on having a team of brilliant people who can assess those three things. Business value, is it going to help me? grow or add value to my business it could be costs out it could be growth up it could be whatever does it enable customer value will the customer see benefit in this will it help them um, you know see a, a growth in our brand and increase brand awareness and consideration all those kind of metrics and then is it aligned with the purpose you know if I'm a um, you know a, a famous brand for curated personalized styling is coming up with robots to come in and do something for my customer the right thing to do no because it's not aligned with my brand story so therefore I'm not ticking you know one of the three which means I shouldn't do it that can be oftentimes a very tough discipline incredibly tough yeah we call it parachuting out and we call it that for <laughs> that's a, a good reason yeah that's we, a good term we like to we like to say when you're in a plane Sometimes it feels like the safest place to be is in the plane. But if that plane is crashing or falling out of the sky, please don't stay in the plane. Right. <laughs> Parachute out of the plane. <laughs> it's better to get out of the plane safely and watch it disappear into the distance than to stay on there and hold on tight in the hope that you were right initially with your instinct. Instinct is wonderful and helpful, especially in retail, but it isn't everything and it is an objective. So how do you kind of create that objectivity, especially early on, that makes you maximize your investment of your dollars and get better outcomes for your business. Well, we have certainly seen year in and year out how many brands, and, and not just in the uh, fashion side of the retail industry, but in, in many other retail and non-retail who have actually gone down with the plane. Very much so. Too many have gone down with the plane. And, um, you know, and right to the end, still claiming that it was the right thing to do. And hindsight is easy, of course. You know, I'm being dramatic with the analogy, but... Um, you know, I've got plenty of stories and I share a few of them in the book about like my time doing that where I was enthralled and hanging on to the plane for dear life and shouldn't have, um, you know, and it, it just it teaches us lessons. But, um, you know, we have to we have to realize that we are programmed, designed as a species. We've evolved as a species to be instinctual. It's a survival mechanism. So we have to just be aware of it and we can overcome it with process and discipline and you know, there's a few simple hints and tips to do it, but really just the main one is just always be curious and ask why. How's it going? Is it really like this or am I letting my biases come in? Um, you know, there's there's lots of little things to do to do it, but to try and overcome it. But please, if the plane's crashing, parachute out, guys. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I think you're right about that. It's very, very easy to tell someone else to do, very difficult not just to let go, but to be able to look objectively at your own business. Yeah, I agree. And it's like you, you, as, as I said before, like when you're in the mess, you're in the mess. And it can feel very different to what the world from outside is seeing. But you also have the blinkers on. I call it the force field. Like you walk through the front door of your office building, you know, which is our own front doors these days. But the front door <laughs> of your office, you kind of pass through this force field and immediately forget that not everyone lives and breathes your brand. Right. In the way that you do. 
and they don't know it. They don't understand it. They don't have the context that you've got. They don't know why you're doing things, the intent behind stuff. All they see is the outcome. Be aware of the force field. It exists. Um, I remember, I'll, tell, I'll share a quick story if I can. Yeah, I please. remember um, basically I was a head of retail for a telco. So we had, you know, it was Australia's, um, you know, AT&T or Verizon. And, you know, we had 400 odd branded stores and, and, you know, several thousand dealers here, there and everywhere. And we were doing this thing about how can we you know, create these incredible experiences and be super innovative. And, you know, I probably had done the thing at NRF where I'd walk down the aisle and said, we should get one of everything. Um, came home, we did a whole bunch of testing with customers and they basically said 99% of the time I need you to just be invisible. Like, I don't even want to know you exist. I don't want my internet to go down. I don't want to get a crazy thing on my bill that I didn't expect. I don't want anything like that. I just need you to be invisible. But when I want you there, I want you to be brilliant. And it reframed our thinking of what we do for a living so dramatically because we realize that it's like it's in those moments, those individual moments that might be one every two years. They're so important that, you know, we need to build it around it. The fact that it's one in every two years, it's not you know, a thousand a day in our icon stores or 500 a day on average in every other store. It's not 500 things a day. It's one every two years for this one person. And it just completely reframed the way we were thinking about our innovation pipeline and our store design and purpose and our digitization program. Um, that context, that force field is incredibly powerful and you have to, you just have to overcome it. And the best way to do it is talk to people, especially customers or your frontline. Your frontline know all of the stupid things you make them do. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's interesting, but we often overlook those people and we're really focused right on big data and big data is important. However, you need that soft data as well to sort of balance the two sides, as you're saying. Absolutely. Quantitative data is one thing and it's helpful in terms of directioning. But when you're designing something coming down to an experience level, quantitative data actually um, sometimes is too often, you know, given the default answer. Qualitative data and the idea of talking to people and getting an understanding of the context of people's lives when you're interacting with them and little things like that, that helps you design better things, better innovations. The quantitative data will help give you direction and understand size of opportunity and all of those kinds of things. But when it comes to the minutiae of when you're designing something, the qualitative data is everything. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, perhaps one of the reasons that people shy away from that, well, there's probably, you know, multiple reasons. But even if you really do have the intention of getting it, it's hard to get. Um, you really have to be very persistent because you go up to somebody and, and we've had that experience with our business. Right now we're trying to study how people consume information and what they like or don't like and, and so forth. And, you know, when you approach people, they haven't thought about that because that's not their business. So you're thinking, wow, okay, I'm going to sit down with somebody and find out what they think. And they haven't really thought about it. <laughs> you're sort of surprised. But until they, and they're more apt to say something if they're angry, right? Then they'll tell you all the reason they're angry. But otherwise, when you sort of talk about things, they're you know, it's tough to get that info. It's tough to get those insights. It, it is. It's, it's, um, it is a really hard skill to learn. And like there are professionals obviously out there that do it that have, you know, give themselves a, a bunch of different names, human centered designers, testers, behavioral economists, all of that kind of stuff. And they're all, you know, unique and interesting in their own way. But at the end of the day, the, the art form of it comes down to questions. Like, are you really good at asking questions and getting to the root cause of things that can kind of oversee bias of your own brand experience and your own intent of the program and ask great questions. And it is hard. Um, I found actually that some of the best people at doing this are people who have sold on a shop floor. Absolutely. Because they've learned how to ask brilliant questions as a career art form. And, you know, if you put them into a um, you know, into a, a design interview to kind of sit there and try and pull out interesting contextual information about a customer's experience in your store and what they found by there, what they looked at, what they didn't. You'll find that a person who's worked in retail will ask such great questions. You'll get really good data. Um, so it's always worth pulling great people out to help you kind of do that and run those sessions um, at any retailer. But like learning the skill is, is, um, is hard but not impossible. There's plenty of courses and all that kind of stuff you can do, but you can also teach yourself 
how to just ask better questions. And, you know, we did a, a ton of research on how to, you know, what's the light form of learning this stuff. And, you know, we've now taught that to a number of retailers and it's, you know, it's, it's improved their, you know, product design teams and experience design teams um, results pretty dramatically, um, even without going through, you know, six months of training. So you can do it. It's just about being step one, be aware of your biases. Um, step two, implement some heuristics and, and things like that, which can help you overcome them. And step three is just improve the way you ask questions and you know, the intent behind the questions. And uh, you'll find that you'll get much better answers when you do do it. Yeah, I, I think that's really a very important process. Now, I know that it's, it's very dif difficult to put a timeline on things, but mm -hmm. if a brand or retailer has the intent to say, I want to really make some changes in my business, I want to get things up to speed, I, we know we need to make some changes, um, what's a realistic timeline? And again, it depends on the intent. Like I'd say, what kind of changes are you talking about? Are you wanting to make, to make perpetual changes in your business that means you can change, um, you know, on a dime um, in the future? Then I'd say if you spend three to six months of concerted effort, you can have some pretty significant transformations of your operations. You know, when we um, wrote the book and when we engage with customers, you know, but, but people are often expecting, it's like, here, can you give me a three-year transformation plan to make me a great innovator? And the answer is, you'll probably it'll probably take three years before you're, you know, you're doing the kind of in innovation and rate of change that perhaps you were looking at. But the change itself of the way your, you know, the fabric of your business works doesn't take that long. Mm. And it's, you know, it's there, it's more a program of nudges than it is anything else. How do you slightly nudge the way you think of capital allocation? How do you nudge the way you govern projects? How do you nudge the way you think about sponsorship? How do you nudge the way you think about the skills that you assign to a project? How do you nudge the way you think about experimentation and testing? You know, all of the use of data. There's like a bunch of, you know, I'll, I'll, we call it gentle pressure relentlessly applied. Um, so it's it's it doesn't take as long as people think. It will take some time before it's embedded and working like a, you know, a well-oiled machine. But in terms of the changes that you need to make yourself, you know, you, you get results from day one. If you're not if you're focused at it, you can start making changes to your business operations from day one of a program and consistently make change that enables you to be a, you know, a better retailer every day than you were the day before. And that's really what retail is all about, right? At the end of the day, count the cash in the till, see, hey, see if you can make tomorrow better. <laughs> it's, this, it's the same mindset. The difference is it's like, hey, let's count the innovation capital in the business and see if we can make it better tomorrow. I like the way you say nudge because I think that many companies feel, you know, I, I think people feel sort of, I don't want to say frightened, but I, I think it is intimidating when people think they have to completely overhaul everything they're doing. And particularly for companies, you know, that are large companies or publicly held companies, radical change can be very, very difficult to pull off for a lot of different reasons. So I think the fact that you're referring to nudging things, which is sort of an, more of an evolutionary process and that that can be effective, I think that opens up a lot more opportunities for people to explore. Yeah, very like to get radical outcomes, you don't need radical change. Sometimes it's the small things that make the biggest difference. And of all people, retailers should know that I move a product up a shelf and I sell ten times the amount. You know, it's a small nudge, but a massive result. And you know, it's the same with something like shifting your process. You can get some incredible results with just a leadership alignment session that just reframes innovation in the mind and the role that each of the leaders play in innovation. And that can dramatically shift outcomes, gets people out of their way, gets people willing to come to the table and talk about measurements and KPIs, you know, all of these things that, um, that that's a tiny little nudge, but it has a dramatic impact. And if you, um, you know, if, if it's, it's, yeah, it's like, it's like a chiropractor, right? You, you can make one little crack in a, in a, uh, in one part of the body and all of a sudden the whole body feels aligned and working better. Um, it's the same thing with an innovation process. It's a whole bunch of series of those little nudges that can have such dramatic impact. You don't need to transform your entire operation. Um, you just need to think smartly about which areas need the need the nudge. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that we've been made to believe that the only way you can get change is, is through sort of massive action or radical overhauls. And I think you're pointing out things that people probably 
knew, but they forgot. Do you know what I'm saying? That, yeah, actually it's true. Well, you have, you know, sometimes just changing the position of where something is in the store or tweaking the signage or just some small thing can actually have an impact. Absolutely. And it's, there, there is a part of modern working culture that has a bit of the blame to take here as well, which is, you know, if we, if we want to win and be seen as successful, you know, we need to do something big and right. bold. Exactly. And, you know, I want to be able to, I want to be put up on the front page of the paper as, you know, the retail's new CEO superstar. Mm. Um, retail's new CEO superstar will not be someone who does some giant big thing. It will be the person who saves a brand that is in a plane that's looking to crash but still could be saved by applying gentle nudges to the process that enables the whole organization to change at a faster and more broad rate. And, um, you know, it's we just need to kind of reframe the way we think about success in organizations because too much it becomes a competitive sport of who's doing the biggest, coolest, most famous thing and project. And that can that's a hype that doesn't align with the, the, you know, the golden rule. Yeah. Is it adding value to the customer? Is it adding value to the business? Is it aligned with the purpose? No. Is it going to make my career look good? Yeah, it will. So, but we get, so we get enthralled with it. Whether we're aware of that or not, I'm not trying to suggest we're all egomaniacs trying to be awesome, but it does, it does become more engaging and we just need to be aware that we're going to be more engaged by something that looks impressive, even though it might not have as big an impact as the thing next to it. You're so right, Andrew. I, I think that this culture of celebrity CEO has taken away from focusing on, like you said, the things that really impact the business and the customer versus the things that, you know, present well in media. Uh, it's really interesting because we have, in, in many ways, gotten away from the basics. Very much so. And I, like, I'll use like a Doug McMillan as an example here, I think. I don't know him as well as perhaps a lot of people who may listen in on this, but you know, he strikes me as very much a, I don't really want the attention. If mm. I could be diverting the attention back to my team and the brand, then I'm doing my job as a leader. And you know, then we see others. You know, who, um, you know, I won't name, but right. who come in, who, who, you know, who give the media interviews every week, and you know, want to have their photo on the front cover of whatever magazine about you know the big transformation that they're going to put in to save brand X. It's like, well, that's not necessarily going to save them. It might give investors a bit of confidence for a little while, which is an important facet. I get it. You know, being a CEO, you've got all that stuff to manage, but you know, there are, you know, you have a finite amount of energy and you need to invest quite a quite a large amount of it into the gentle nudges that will have the biggest impact rather than um rather than you know the next media interview yeah ab absolutely just one last question and that is as an insider looking at the retail industry what do you think that many people either overlook or perhaps really struggle to adapt to in a changing retail market what would be the top things Oh, big question. I like. I'll, I'll go high level first. Like, okay. I think, I think a um, the retail industry is massively underestimated, in so many different ways. The impact it has on society, maybe came, became a little more apparent in 2020 than it has before, but it's still underestimated. Um, it's underestimated as a career. It's underestimated in terms of investment. Um, I think you know you you look at some of the numbers around you know profits and you know, success rates for retail real estate. You know they might they might be struggling but they're still very 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 big numbers and you know it's just it's it's just an underestimated industry and I think um, retail is naturally are you know, shopkeepers are quiet um, maybe more so than some other verticals and I think that can have a um, that has an impact on making us underestimated and that underestimation unfortunately means there's less investment less people you know talented people coming in here and choosing this as a career and i think being incredibly proud to be a retailer i am so proud to have shopkeeper as the first word under my title because that's what i do and that's what i'm very proud of doing and i you know i love this industry and i think we need to kind of all play a part in shifting that na that narrative um so that was my high level probably rant okay <laughs> <laughs> but the um i think more importantly it's like there are you know, from a, a retail point of view, sometimes when you're, I saw a stat the other day that said 15% of retail CEOs think they're keeping up with change. Mm. And that means that, you know, a bunch of them are wrong. <laughs> so they are <laughs> keeping up with change, but they don't think they are. So there is this 
perception, I think, around you know what evolution looks like and what innovation looks like that we need to just redefine. Um, you know, innovation is not those big hyped up fancy things that get attention that cost millions and millions of dollars. Innovation is an ability to change and a change at a, a fast rate and broadly. And if you can reframe that, you'll do very well. And it's the you know when you're and when you're in the mess, when you're in the mess of trying to rebuild or reset or you know insert whatever word here makes sense for your business, um, it's you're going to feel the mess. That's natural. It is not the reality though, and it's really important to kind of step out sometimes and have that reflective moment of like, how am I really going? Because if you just focus in on the mess, that's going to increase stress, which is going to decrease creativity, which is going to decrease you know innovation as a process. So you know when you're in the mess, it's going to be messy. So you know take a step. Uh, up onto the platform and look down at the bigger picture every now and again um, to try and reset your view of the world. So make sure that you're doing the right things and focused on the right things. I think that's really good advice. And I think those are important things that a lot of people overlook. I think so too. And like the people like, there's, if I have one actionable tip that goes with it, I have a habit that I do every day, which is I have a coffee with myself. <laughs> and it, it is um, basically, I you know, I used to be at a cafe um, but you know, nowadays, obviously that's a little bit different. It's on the patio, but, um, you know, I, I don't have a device with me. I don't have papers to read. I just kind of be, and I do it for a lot of reasons. Uh, but the, the main one is, you know, the acknowledgement that I am a machine. My brain is a machine that processes information and it needs, you know, it's, it's an organic machine, but it's a machine nonetheless. It processes tons and tons and tons of information every single day. And if I don't give it the space to sometimes reflect and let it filter the important bits to sink in and get rid of the bits that don't matter, it won't do it. And therefore, I'm going to be less effective at what I do. And I do this because at the end of it, I can be more um, in the conversation and aware of you know, myself and, and be you know, a, prop, a better listener, a better sharer, a better everything when it comes to me and my team and my, my clients. Um, it makes me a better retail expert because I can start thinking differently and more creatively about all of the information and pieces that I've come that have come into my head in that day um, so it's it's just this incredibly powerful 15 minutes and it's not a lot of time and I know everyone's you know very busy and important but that 15 minutes is something that can actually create a pretty large shift in the way you lead and the way you you, know, you turn up to to your retail business which can have a big cultural impact very small change very small nudge but big impact I think that's excellent advice. Now, where can we find your book? Um, I mean, it, it's cliche as it is. It's like all good book sh bookstores. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, you can buy it. Um, the easiest way, of course, is uh, is Amazon. Um, our, our website, www.thinkuncommon.com, also has copies um, available. You can also learn a bit more about the process and, and who we crazy retail innovation people are. Um, so we'd love to see anyone pop by there and say hello. Uh, but other than that, yes, just any good online bookstore. Well, I'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well so people can have the link. And um, I'm sure that people will want to read that and be able to take an even deeper dive into a lot of the things that you're, you're suggesting. Because I think this is, you know, the pandemic, of course, has been a terrible thing for many, many businesses but it's an opportunity perhaps for others to get a fresh start and, and perhaps end up better than they were before. Absolutely. And just that, that simple reframe of you know, what it is that it means for my business rather than getting caught up in the hype. Just think, think small. Think about your brand. Think about your habits. Think about your business's operation and those small nudges that you can apply and you'll make such a big difference. But um yeah, it's been, a, it's been a very tough year, and it's like, have that coffee with yourself and celebrate the fact that you're still here. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I think if nothing else, we have to be grateful for that. Very much so. Yeah, Andrew, thank you so much for joining me on A Seat at the Table and for sharing so many important insights. This has really been, it's been very enlightening. Oh, thank you very much. I've had a blast on the conversation. So, no, thank you so much for having me, Jane. It's been great. Oh, my pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode of A Seat at the Table, join me each week when I sit down with leading executives and entrepreneurs who share their insights, experiences, and future vision for business. And make sure to visit Spin Expo. From trend information to technical innovation, Spin Expo is the primary exhibition for yarns and knitwear. 
the fair provides well-edited forums featuring high-quality products that are bursting with creativity. To learn more, go to spinexpo.com. That's S-P-I-N-E-X-P-O dot com. You can also find a link in the show notes for this episode. Before you go, our Q1 Current Situation and Sourcing Executive Report is available. You can find more information about this and other useful links in the show notes. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Jane Singer, and I'll see you in the next podcast episode.